Five years ago this week, the Me Too movement went viral. It brought light to millions of cases of sexual harassment and harassment around the world. And joining me now is the founder of that movement, Tarana Burke. Tarana, it's great to have you in the studio. It's great to see you and meet you uh, in person. Finally, been following your work uh, for so many years. Oh, um, as we mentioned, it's been five years since uh, this movement was launched. Um, how do you? It's been a remarkable journey. Um, how do you take it all in? How do you evaluate what these past five years have been? Well, you know, the way I've been framing it and trying to help people frame it is that when five-year marks happen in civil rights movements or any kind of social justice movements, people tend to want to talk about all the things that have happened and, um, you know, how do you, how do you feel? But what I've been talking about lately is what Me Too has made possible. Because it's easy to codify, like you talked about, the laws and the policies and the cases. But I think it's really important to think about what the last five years have made possible because just five and a half years ago, we couldn't have a sustained conversation about sexual violence in this mm. country. And now we can. Five and a half years ago, survivors of sexual violence, no matter how they identified, couldn't feel comfortable to talk about the things that they experienced. And now we can. So we have made so much more possible in the last five years. In fact, we probably made more possible in the last five years than we could have in, in the next 20 years. What, what do you attribute that to? Is it a, is it a, simply a cultural shift or is it simply the fact that everybody realized, hey, you are not alone and that the sheer volume of um, people who had survived sexual abuse was so compelling that it could no longer be ignored? You couldn't look away. Yeah. I think that when it went viral for the, the sheer number of people that came forward, I think, you know, of course you had the celebrities and people like that who came out, but you cannot take away from the labor of survivors who came forward, right? Mm. Everyday people who decided to put the hashtag online or tell a friend or just to disclose for the first time, it was so many people. You're talking about tw uh, in the first 24 hours, there were 12 million disclosures across social wow. media. You cannot ignore that. Yeah. And I think once that happened, it created a community community in one of the places that we don't even find to be safe a lot of times for survivors. It created community on the internet mm. and that spilled over into real life. And once people couldn't look away, then we started building from there. You, as I mentioned, you started working with young brown and black girls in Alabama. That's where this began. Um, but since then, this movement has evolved. And I want to just know how has your work evolved from what you were doing in Alabama to what you are doing now? How has that informed the way that you organize and the way that you collectively mobilize um, your team and the organization? Well, first of all, our work evolved from girls from, from the very beginning, even before 2017. Mm. I started with black and brown girls in Alabama. We started including more and more people even before 2017 came. But one of the biggest things that I think I learned in the last five years is that we have to focus on culture shift and narrative change, right? We can change as many laws and policies if we want to, but if we don't change the way people understand sexual violence, if we don't um, undermine the roots of rape culture in this country, then it won't, it won't matter what kind of laws we pass. In fact, we've had laws on the books to say these things are illegal for years, but people ignore them. It's the culture that we have that makes the space for the violence. Once we undermine that, then we will have people engaging differently with sexual violence. Understand it as a public health crisis and a social justice issue. I was moved by a piece that you wrote in Time Magazine uh, this week, and I want to read a little bit of it, because you wrote um, that you referenced a woman you encountered during the uh, uh, Christine Blasey Ford testimony. She told you that she wished Ford could remember more Mm -hmm. And, you know, we see often that survivors are easily dismissed when they can't recount exactly every detail of what they survived and what they endured. And somehow, because they can't remember every single detail, um, they are not the perfect victim. And talk to me a little bit about this idea. And when you talk about the cultural shift that needs to happen about what we need to do to simply believe women. This is what I call the life cycle of a survivor. I think it's a misconception we have, right, because of all the television shows. I'm a survivor myself, and that's why I, I use that story to explain. People think there are some people who remember every single detail and every single moment, and then you have to understand, this is some of the worst things that have ever happened to us. I don't want to remember. I do remember a lot of the details, and because I don't want to remember, I, lose, I would rather lose all of my memory than to remember that moment in my life. Mm. And I think it's things like that that people don't get about what sexual violence is. You have to compare it as a type of death 
for so many people, right? You've taken a part of us that we can never get back. We can only try to get something new in its place and try to be whole again. When people understand what sexual violence does to a person, then I think they will engage with it differently and engage. It's not about individuals. It's about our collective safety. Just if you care about gun violence, you should care about sexual violence mm. because it's about our safety, about community safety. I want to ask you about um, men in this. Um, a, what role do men play yeah. in this movement? What, when you talk about a cultural shift and a change of the system, men are obviously a big part of that uh, of that reality. How do we change it? What is what is incumbent on men to do in this system change that you're talking about? Well, one, it's incumbent on all of us to, to know that men are survivors too, right? So the first role of men in the Me Too movement is as survivors. We have to stop thinking about this as a woman's movement, and we have to stop thinking about sexual violence as something that only happens to women. Once we understand this happens to all of us, then maybe all of us will engage as, in this as something that we have to all attack together. But I also think that we have to talk about power and privilege. And we have to understand that people don't ever want to relinquish their power and privilege. Mm. And it's about, when you think about power and privilege, you think about people who are the most vulnerable, right? Those are the people who are always going to be attacked. And people don't ever want to relinquish their power and privilege. Men who have a lot of power and privilege have to be, do some self-analysis. People who have a lot of power and privilege have to do self-analysis about where the, how they use that power and privilege, right? Sex, I mean, um, sexual violence is not about sex and it's not about desire. It's about power and privilege. And once we sort of rethink the way we've been engaging with that and understand that, then we can understand how we fight this issue differently. Uh, Tarana Burke, it's been uh, five years it, longer since the beginning of this movement, but mm -hmm. thank you for the incredible work you and everyone else is doing. We have a long way to go uh, to make it right, but uh, it is an important milestone nonetheless. Thank you so much. It's great to see you. Thank you for thank having you. me. Uh, and